Good evening. Welcome to Redemption Church. My name is Rory. I'm one of the pastors here. Thank you for uh, gathering with us on a cold, not as cold as last night, but a very cold and frigid evening to celebrate the night before which our Savior was born. Um, if I could see you all, that'd be great, but it's all good. It's nice and moody and <laughs> dark, and it'll be lit up here in a little bit. But uh, Christmas Eve at Redemption Church is, uh, it's, it's evolved over the years, but at its core, what we are about as a church and as a people this evening is to prepare our hearts, which if you're anything like me, your heart needs prepared for tomorrow because there will be chaos and clutter and gift wrapping that needs burned out in the backyard and boxes on boxes and packages and everything and it is a whole lot of a lot but tonight is a night where we take the time to be still to reflect and to remember why the heck we're doing all that we're doing this season why we run ourselves ragged why we make the last minute trips to the mall, why we go above and beyond in everything and anything that calls to our attention this season is because Christ is born. Jesus has come. The Savior of the world has come into the world in order that the world might be saved through him. That's what we're about this evening, from beginning to end. And so to that end, I want to invite our Advent candle lighters to come on up here. And every week we've been lighting a new candle, one of uh, five, and tonight we'll light our fifth candle to celebrate the fact that Christ has come into the world and that he is the light of the world. Who's got a lighter? Come on, I know there's someone. I, this is this is West Virginia. There's someone's got a lighter in their pocket. There it is, right there. <laughs> of course, it's Josh. Thanks, Pastor Josh. Go ahead. A reading. A reading from Galatians 4, 4 through 7. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoptions as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Let's stand and let's worship the light of the world who's come into the world to save the world. Welcome to Redemption Church.
you can be seated. Well, Merry Christmas. Welcome to Redemption Church. My name is Josh, one of the pastors here. Go ahead and find, if you have a copy of the scriptures, Luke chapter 1 and Matthew chapter 1. We'll have those verses on the screen for you as well. Well, first impressions, I don't have to tell you, can be, can be crucial. They not only can make or break opportunities, but the impact and the influence that they have on our lives can echo into our future, and some of those impressions and our uh, decisions out of them even can impact our destiny. Being human beings, we have a nature that is at times impulsive, so that we make snap judgments, we can uh, make decisive uh, decisions, and come to sort of intuitive, conclusive even, opinions. But none of that comes out of a vacuum, although that can seem to happen fast. That's why first impressions can be so radically different even with the same person that we're encountering or going through the same experience. That we all bring to that impression our uh, sort of core values. We have foundational beliefs. We see things through a, a lens, a worldview that has been shaped by our experiences. We, we have uh, deeply held convictions so that as we are impressed by whatever it is, we respond. I'm thinking about all this, particularly this month, because this month marks the 25th anniversary of my becoming engaged to my wife. Uh, it, it was uh, a wonderful, obvious, obviously for us, great time, but it, it was a result of different first impressions that we both had eight months prior in March of the same year. Uh, I was, when we, we got engaged, 20, and she was 18, but when we first went on our date and had those first impressions, she was 17, and I was 19. And I'd only been a Christian about two weeks and had only known her for a few hours. But when I got home from the date, my best friend at the time asked me how it was. And I said, I'm going to marry her. First impression. He goes, really? I said, she loves Jesus. She's pretty. She wants to be a wife and a mother. And I tried to kiss her, and she wouldn't let me. And so she's got integrity and character that she wouldn't just you know, make out with a stranger here after only knowing him for, for a few hours. Sarah's first impression was different. Uh, no surprise. Laugh while you can. Uh, but, but she went home. Her sister asked, older sister, how that went. And uh, she said, well, I'm not sure. And she didn't mean this in a good way. He is unlike any other person I've ever met. I have no idea if I like him or hate him. And, and so... Uh, I was ready to get married after just, uh, you know, a handful of, of moments with her, but I did think, all right, I'm 19, she's 17, I need to stay out of prison, I need to at least wait till she turns 18, uh, but it took me eight months from March to December to get uh, her on the same page with me, so I found myself on my knee with a ring in my hand, and it was a festivist miracle, she said, yes. So, to prove the point that first impressions aren't everything, but they are something, and if, if they mean anything, then I think we would be hard-pressed to, to look at Jesus' first impression in his coming to the earth. God's choice, in particular, of how he would first impress upon the world for whom Christ had come by giving him the name that he gave him. Think of that. That the first news that humanity receives 
from the eternal God who created everything before Jesus was ever born into the world, before he cried, before he could be seen or heard or smelled or touched, before he would say anything, before he would do anything, God was communicating the message and the impression that he wanted to make in his coming by the very name that he would get. That's right, by the way. Joseph and Mary didn't get to name their baby. God chose the name for them. And in two different places, in two different ways, at two different times with both Mary and Joseph, an angel, as the intermediary, announced to each of them one of the very first things that they would know is this will be his name. Let me show you. Look first at Luke 1. We'll see Mary getting the, the information and the instruction. And then in Matthew, we'll look at, at Joseph's getting the news. First, the context is told to us in verse 26. In the sixth month, of uh, the angel Gabriel, that sixth month being the sixth month of her cousin Elizabeth's pregnancy, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph. Different engagement. Of, of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary, and this angel came to her. Now, unless I miss my guess, many of you, perhaps most of you, have the image in your mind of an angel that is a presupposition given to you by culture. So your first impression of that story is perhaps a beautiful, human-looking creature wearing white, maybe glowing, maybe some sort of aura around their head that we might call a halo, maybe hovering, but sort of looking attractive, in impressive in a positive way. We don't know what Gabriel looked like. We, we know very little about angels in general. We don't know that they all look the same or that they always look the same way. We do have a number of descriptions a handful of times in the Bible. I'm particularly thinking right now of the prophet Isaiah's vision that he got, not just of one angel, but a whole host of angels. And he says they have six wings. Two were covering their feet, two were covering their face, and with two they flew. Whatever this angel looks like, whether it's Isaiah's angel or another kind, almost, I think, universally in the scriptures, when angels show up, it's not, oh, how pretty, how nice. It's usually terror, hiding, covering their face, sometimes falling to the ground. And so here's Mary going about her day, perhaps preparing a meal, cleaning the house, reading a book, maybe sleeping. I, I don't know. When this angel comes in, who is terrifying, what would your first impression be? Mine, would, if I'm being honest, would, would be fear. Maybe hit it. It's coming out of nowhere. Get out of my house. Throw something at it. And look at the message. It's, it indicates that. Verse 30, the angel said to her, Don't be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. She didn't earn favor, earn this right. She found grace. That's the word. Found grace with God. And behold, here's the message. You will conceive in your womb and bear a son. And here's the impression. You are to call his name Jesus. Let's be clear on that. You don't get to pick the name. You didn't get a pick that you were going to be the one, the virgin, to have the baby, to bear the child. You will also not get the name to name the child. His name will be Jesus. And look at her response. She don't need eight months. Right now, Mary said, Behold, I'm the servant of the Lord. Let it be done to me, or be to me, according to your word. And just as quick as the angel came, the angel leaves. Some of you perhaps came to Christ that quickly. Maybe you were a child, you, you knew very little, but you knew enough. Maybe it was the first time you can remember even hearing of Jesus. But your response was, yes, I want him. I see my need. 
I desire to have him as the gift. I receive him. Others of you, turn to Matthew 1, are more like Mary's fiancé, Joseph, and you, you need time. Uh, he wasn't there. He didn't see the angel. All he knows is the story that he gets from, from Mary, and like me, like many of you, he's suspicious. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't believe that. I don't believe in virgin births. I don't believe you've been touched by an angel. I, I, I don't believe that happened. I, I, I don't believe this story that you're sexually pure yet, yet pregnant. So no, not interested. No thanks. And I don't want to be a jerk about it, but, but we're breaking up. And we'll do it quietly, and I'll do it as respectfully as, as I can, but, but it's, it's over. It's not for me. When graciously God, in the course of time, gives him an angel, but his is in a dream, which I always thought was kind of impressive. If an angel shows up, that's compelling. I have a dream, maybe some bad Chinese food. I, I might be able to explain that away. Joseph gets a dream in verse 20. As he was considering these things, these things that Mary had shared with him, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife. She's telling the truth. For that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son. And again, you shall call his name Jesus. There's the name again. Why the name? Twice. Explicit. I mean, of all the names of Hebrew history and the annals of the great people of faith that, that they have in their resume to, to name their boys, why Jesus? Why not Abraham, the father of nations, the, the father of our faith? Or Isaac and Jacob and Joseph, those patriarchs? Or Moses, the great deliverer of God's people? Throughout the year, annually, they're telling his story and celebrating the freedom that he had. Or, or, or maybe the great kings, David or Solomon. Or the prophets, Elijah or Daniel or Isaiah. And, and God doesn't pick any of those names. And, and the name that he does pick in Hebrew is a Hebrew name, but it, it's sort of a shortened Greek version of the, of the name Yeshua. Joshua. He's a player. He, he gets a book. But, but not a major player compared to the other ones. So, so why Iesu? Jesus. Because it means Savior. That, that, that's God's first word to humanity in the sending of His Son. Before he's born, before he does anything at all, you'll simply hear his name and you will get in summation form who he is and what he's done. That God's first step toward humanity into, uh, in, in the message of unto us a son is given, unto us a child is born, is not your creator or your, your king. He's both of those. But that's not the first thing I want you to know of him. It's not he will be the judge of the world or the light of the world, even, although he's that. Not even the Son of God, and he's always existed within that nature and capacity. No, no the first crucial impression that you need to know of him is he's your Savior. Because you'll never stop needing Him as your Savior. That is the essence of His person. That is the message of His life. That is the purpose of His death. That is the result of His resurrection. That is why when you read of the salvation that Christ brings, you see it in every tense possible. Sometimes it's in past perfect tense. You have been saved. Sometimes it's present tense. You are being saved. Saved. 
Sometimes it's future sense. You tense. You will be saved. Because you will never stop needing saved. And we need saved for so many things. We need saved from the demonic. We need saved from depression. We need saved from sickness. We need saved from, from addiction. We need saved from the futility of self-glory. We need saved from conflict. We need saved from death. But the angel makes no, leaves us with no confusion with the number one thing that we need saved from. And the reason that his name will be Savior. See the last part of verse 21. You shall call his name Jesus. Why? Because he will save his people from their sins. That's first and foremost why he was sent and why he came. Not to save us from a lack of education. Not to save us from a lack of, of resources. Not to save us from a lack of brotherly love for our neighbor. Not to save us from a lack of, of unity in the world scene. It's to save us from a lack of God. Because as sinners made in God's image, we are separated from God himself. That his glory was stamped onto our souls and our sin has not only hurt us and hurts others, but it defaces the glory in which he's given us. And God being just and no compromiser of his glory must vindicate these glory bearers. But he's also infinite loving, infinitely loving. And he loves unconditionally. And so God has within himself this conflict, this tension of his justice and his love needing fully satisfied yet sinful humanity. The answer is a savior who will do for us what we can never do for ourselves. We must be righteous. Christ lives the righteous life. We must have our sins paid for, but we're not sinless. He's sinless. So he makes possible the forgiveness of our sins. He can come back to life. And so, so he is raised to give us the hope of eternal life so that we can not only know God, but enjoy God and receive his, his love. That's why the, the most famous verse in your Bible really is a Christmas verse. John 3.16 for God so loved the world that he gave a gift. What gift? The Savior, Jesus, his only Son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. Notice who that's for. It means, it, it means it's for all of us. It doesn't matter how bad you are, how, what bad things you've done, how long you've done it. It says, whoever. So it's available to all. And how is it received? Faith. Whoever believes in him. That's the heart of the issue. That's always the turning point. Will you believe in him? Will you receive him? Will you trust him? Will you take him? Will you unwrap and take into your life the gift? That he's, that he's given. That's why we celebrate Christmas. Because it is another year of saying divine love has descended as a Savior. That hope has arrived for our future in the person of the Savior. That joy that we so badly want and nothing seems to get deep enough or last long enough is now possible in this Savior. So we can sing with Mary in Luke 147, how my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. And the great thing about Christmas 
This is the great thing about Christmas. Up here. <laughs> is that God every single year says, I want you to reconsider the first impression. I want you to keep coming to that impression. I, I, I want you, I'm going to even hardwire it into your culture, into your calendar. That whether you're in Walmart or school or in the car or you're turning on Spotify or you're seeing signs, that it will be inescapable for you to see Jesus, 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 Savior, 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 over and over again saying, would you like a Savior? Would, would you like a gift? And tragically, year after year, there are many who say, nope, no thanks. Not interested. Uh, if it'll help, I'll plead. If it'll help, this, this dumb country preacher will pound a pulpit and say, say yes. Say yes this year, please. Say yes. You don't have to know all the implications of how he'll change your life. You, you, there's no obligation. There's no cost. Jesus paid it all. All to him we owe. You, you simply come to the place to say, I've heard it. I, I know the facts. I know the story. But this year, I see it. This year, I, I, I'll consider it. I'll open myself up to it. I, I, whatever, I, I just say, don't dare end this year and go into the next without knowing. Do you have a Savior? Have you received the gift? If you haven't tonight, what a great night. Christmas Eve. To just quietly in your mind and the quietness of your spirit which we're going to go into in just a few seconds, and say to God, I, I, I don't know what's next, and I still have a lot of questions, but right here tonight, I, I've heard what I've heard, and I say, yes, I'll take him. Let's pray. Father, you, you repeatedly offer this beautiful gift of your Son. This repeated, continual pursuit of people. And how kind and merciful and patient you are to give us another Christmas. It, it not only makes it possible for us to, to know Christ, but it makes it possible for us to be saved by Christ. You have given us a gift of yourself. I pray whether it's the first time or a repeated time, but bring us to the place where we see the Savior and say, yes, we take Him now. We take Him again. We remember again. So thank you for the gift that saves. In the name of Jesus, our Savior, Redemption Church said. I'm still up. Sorry. We are going to... Uh, light some candles. Go ahead and stand with me. And as you do, we're going to make uh, our way down the, the rows and on 
the ends, start lighting some candles, and then progressively turn to your neighbor and pass the light on to, to one another. We'll sing a handful of songs as we do that and progressively watch the room get brighter and brighter as a symbol of the light of the world that came in the person of Christ and who is now, as we receive that light, given us the task and the mission of making him known to others as progressively God has chosen to include us as his sons and daughters in the spreading of the good news that Jesus saves. So Lydia will lead us in some singing and and we'll uh, we'll exit after that. Thanks.
blow out your candles. Thank you for worshiping with us this evening. I'll echo the words of the song we just sang and make it my heart's prayer that none of you will leave here with Christ as a stranger, but as your adored. And if tonight may be the night, like Pastor Josh said, that you may have become a Christian for the first time, then what a night to make it that night. And welcome to the family. We are not going to be worshiping tomorrow morning and the uh, next Sunday as well. Our next service will be on January 8th, and so you can join us then. Um, take those candles and drop them off in the basket either behind the wall right there or there's one at the Connect desk as well. You can fill out a Connect card if you were maybe just put your faith in Jesus and want to tell us about it or you want to uh, just get more connected into what we're doing here at Redemption Church. We'd love to have you, and that is the easiest way to get that done. So. Take those, don't put them in the trash, you know, just in case, and put them in the, ba the baskets behind the wall or at the Connect desk, there is a basket as well. Now, posture yourselves to receive this benediction, stretch out your hands, and we'll be dismissed afterwards. Now may the truth of this Advent season leave a lasting impression upon you so that you leave this place more aware of who Jesus is than you were before. May you see him as the light of the world, the Lord of life, the Son of God, and the King of glory. But may you especially see him as the Savior of your soul. Go now from this place and celebrate with your loved ones that all of this is true. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and Redemption Church together said, Amen. You're dismissed.